Okay. So, what is that? Come on. Open up. There it goes. Tonight, we are talking about decision making. Um, and decision making, we think we know what it is as human beings. And we do for us. But um, for computers, we don't. We have to learn how to think about making a decision and how to communicate that to the computer. Because the computer doesn't know what we know. The computer has no concept that the sky is blue or that it's dark outside or, you know, that I'm sitting on a couch. The computer knows nothing. We have to teach it how to know something. And... Um, so that's what we're doing tonight. We're learning how to get the computer to make a decision. Um, first of all, let's talk about some background. Um, understanding how to write, understanding how decisions are made in any programming language, and for us, Python, is the first part in writing algorithms. And algorithms are the bread and butter for computer programmers. An algorithm doesn't have to be a deep math concept. It, it really is a series of steps that you are asking the computer to take to do something. And those series of steps often have decisions or branches. You're going to have you're going to ask a question to the computer, and the computer is going to answer. And that's an algorithm. So. Um, yeah, an algorithm is just a procedure for solving computational problems. You've got a big computational problem coming up in week seven, and it's called your game. Um, the foundations of algorithms. Well, we're starting tonight with decisions um, and branching. Next week, we go into looping. Looping is another form of decisions and branching that is done repeatedly. Functions are naming a group of commands so that they are callable by that name. Data structures are lists and dictionaries. That's pretty much what we're going to talk about, and it's how to organize our data. Uh, data storage is, is writing to disk. It's persisting data. And eight is object-oriented, and that is another way of grouping not just your data, but your data and your functions into, a, into an encapsulated thing that you can use again and again and again. So tonight, we're talking about how to get the computer to make a decision. Okay, we've got some new keywords, and we're going to have some new operators too. So our keywords are if, elif, and else. Now, if says, Python, it's time to make a decision. L if is, Python, make another decision, but only when the if statement was not true. L if says, when all else fails, do this. So those are the three keywords, and they're related. We haven't really dealt with, relation, with keywords that are related, but for if, l, if, and else, they are. You always start with an if in your decision making. If there are potentially multiple decisions that are related, you would then have an l, if. You will never have an l, if without an else. Sorry, without an if. And the else is very similar. If all else fails, then do what's under the else. But you cannot have an else without an if. It all starts with if. So, special operators for making decisions. These are called relational operators. And that's what they are. They are not doing assignment like we've done in the past. You know, we've said, you know, a variable's on the left-hand side, there's a value on the right-hand side, we put that value into the variable, and that's assignment. This is talking about 
comparing. That's what relational operators do. They compare want something on their left-hand side to something on their right-hand side. On the left-hand side is usually a variable. On the right-hand side is usually a value or another variable that you are using to compare. So the first operator is the double equal sign. Now, you heard me in week one, and I kept talking about the single equal sign. That's why I kept talking about the single equal sign, because there is a double equal sign. And that double equal sign is equivalent. That's what I'm asking. I'm saying, is what's on the left-hand side equivalent to what is on the right-hand side? That is a comparison. The next one that we have is the exclamation point and an equal sign. And that is not, excuse me, not equal to. The exclamation point with any of these signs says not. So it reverses what the outcome would be. The next comparator, less than, we all know less than from math, and it's very similar. Greater than, sorry, less than or equal to, same thing from math. Greater than and greater than or equal to are all the same kind of comparators you use in math. So we now have three new Boolean operators, and this is a lot of new stuff this week. So a Boolean operator is allowing you to compound relational statements, okay? So maybe you want a lot of things to be compared all at once. Well, that's what Boolean operators are for. And, or, and not. Those are the three Boolean operators. Not means the opposite, and says both sides have to be true for the whole statement to be true, or all sides have to be true. Everything has to be true for the statement to be true. Or says one thing has to be true for a, the whole statement to be true. And why am I talking about true or false? Those are the only two answers you get. When you're talking to Python about decisions, you will either get a true or you will get a false. That's it, the only way they can answer. And that's what we have. We have two possible values, true and false. That's it. So before I talk about syntax and formatting, I'm going to tell you that computers are stupid. And I know we're all thinking, but, you know, we play these games online, and I've got this great little computer that's my phone. Um, and how can computers be stupid? Well, computers are stupid. Computers only talk, only know two states, on or off. That's it. It's like a light switch, and it's not even a dimmer switch, okay? You turn the light on or you turn the light off. And in Python, it's the same thing, true and false. Not a dimmer switch. There's nothing between true and false. It is either true or it is false. Those are the only two answers you get from Python, no matter what question you are asking. So when you are starting to, talk, to think about writing your algorithm and think about the decisions you have to make, you're really going to have to break those decisions down into very, very small pieces. And that's because you're going to have to have Python evaluate them, and Python doesn't understand a lot. So right here I'm just talking about syntax and formatting, okay? So we have the first line, which is sky equal blue. Well, that's an assignment. We know it's an assignment. I know that sky is um, a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, and the value is blue, and that's on the right-hand side. Now, the next line down is different. I have an if statement. So the if statement says, hey, Python, you're getting ready to make a decision. So it's not just a normal statement line. You're going to have to make a decision. And after the if, I actually have the statement itself. And in this case, it's, at, it's saying, you can read it like this, the sky is blue, true or false. This is just like those true or false questions you got in elementary school or middle school, where you can only do true or false. 
that's exactly what we're doing here. And it's that simple. Now, at the end of every conditional statement is a colon. That colon tells Python that it's done making a decision. It doesn't have to make any more decisions after that colon. It just has to do something. So if we're asking a question and we're writing it in the English language, we end with a question mark. Well, that's the equivalent here. And you cannot forget your colon or you will get weird syntax errors that will drive you crazy. Um, so that is your statement. And then you have a block of code. Now this is the first time we talk about the concept of a block of code. A block of code is code that will only be run when the, the conditional statement above it has evaluated to true. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. Python doesn't care about those lines. It completely skips over them. So if the sky is blue, I'm going to print yippee and sunny day time to play. If the sky is not blue, Python's going to ignore it. It's not going to even see those lines. So that's an if statement. And then I have an elif keyword. Elif always comes after an if or another elif. The syntax and formatting is the same. I'm going to say, in this case, my variable sky is the same as red, or you can read it, sky is the same as red, true or false. And that is how I'm going to ask the question. And Python's going to say, hey, look at sky. What's the value of sky? Well, sky is blue, so it's not red, so it's false. And then I have my else statement. Else is, again, telling Python to make a decision. Now, there's no statement after the else. There's nothing in between else and that colon because there's nothing more to do. Else is the default. Else is what happens when nothing above it evaluates to true. Now, if you're looking at the order of these, if is always first. When you have the need for multiple conditions, L if, however many you have, because you can have lots, are after the if. And finally, there's an else. Now, you can have an else without any L ifs, but you cannot have an else without an if. Just like you cannot have an L if on its own, you have to always have an if first. So, the minimum you can have is an if statement, and after that you can have elif and else statements. But they all have to be associated, and they're mutually exclusive. And we're about to see that, I think. Yeah. So they're mutually exclusive. What does mutual exclusivity mean? Something is mutually exclusive when if one th or when one thing happens, none of the other stuff will. So since sky is blue, I will execute the if statement and the block under it, and the other two won't even exist to Python. And we'll see that in the debugger in just a minute. So those are code blocks. Your code blocks have to be indented properly. This is where some people get really frustrated with Python because it is difficult sometimes to properly indent your code. That's what places like PyCharm are for. They make life easier, and the tab key makes life easier. Don't try and space these things. Just tab. It just makes it easier. At a minimum, your code block has to be indented one tab, one tab um, after uh, sorry, underneath the if statement. And you'll notice here that all my little green if, elif, else are lined up, and all my blocks are lined up, print, print, print. And that's because they have to be, or Python's going to give you an error. Um, I think I said all of these. Um, 
It's only a code block if it's indented. So computers aren't smart, neither are programming languages. So what I want to say is, am I young? And what Python says is, huh? It doesn't know how to evaluate young. It has no clue what the word young means. Um, so we're going to have to tell it what young means before we can ask it to make a decision. Um, so here's how to ask a question. It's really a true-false test, just like you took in middle school. So how do I ask the question, am I young, to Python? Well, first of all, I have to have something that contains my test. So I, I need, you know, what, how old am I? I mean, that's the place we have to start. So I'm creating a variable called user age, and I'm going to, I'm going to get that information in from somebody on the command line. And it must be defined and assigned before the if statement. So you saw it in the last one. Here is the same pattern. Okay, you have a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Somehow you're getting a value into that. Now, the test is against the variable. So I've inputted user age. So now I'm going to do a test, and the test can be read. User age is less than or equal to 18, true or false. If I am less than 18, then I'm going to print 18 or less. That only happens if I'm less than or 18. Otherwise, I'm going to print, nope, you're over 18. And actually, I'm going to stop here, and we're going to look at challenge 3.2.2. So let's go back. Yes. Yes, um, Kaylin, the videos are in specific playlists. So I have a playlist for each module. So everything I've done for the last like three years for module three is under a module three playlist. And then everything I've done so far for this class, for 22EW5, is under its own playlist and the same with 22EW4. So everything is organized into playlists. Is that it? OK. So I'm going to pull up 23.2.2, sorry. So here's 3.2.2. And I'm going to make this bigger. I don't need break.py up. And I am going to edit that. And 3.2.2. Come on, where are you? There it is. So let's talk about this. And 3.2.2 says write an expression that will cause the following code to print 18 or less. I don't know why I have that there 15 million times. But, and then if the value of user age is 18 or less, write only the expression. So I have age is, I'm going to input something, and it's going to be an integer because there's no way to compare a string with less than or equal to. You can compare strings with the equal operator and with the not equal operator, but it's really hard to compare with less than or equal. So most of the Boolean operators, all the Boolean operators are great with ints and floats. Some of them can't be used for strings. So this is going to be an integer as shown on line four. Okay. Now I talk about left hand side and right hand side. So the left hand side is usually the variable and it is on the left hand side of Boolean operator. That is the value that I'm going to test. And I'm going to test it against what's on the right-hand side. Now, the right-hand side could be another variable with a value in it, or it could be a static like 18. So let's go and 
run through this a couple of times, and then I'm going to break it and show you a few things. So we're going to debug this. I'm going to put that my age is 10. Uh, sorry, no. What is going on? View safety features, debugger. Okie dokie, 3.0, oh, 3.2.2, my bad. Not 3.3.2, 3.2.2. There we are. Now we'll run the right program. In the debugger we go. So I'm going to put my age as 10. And get rid of this little guy. So if I go here under variables, I see I have created a variable called user age. It has the value 10. So now I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to, I'm going to make this a true false statement. User age is less than or equal to 18, true or false. Well, 10 is less than or equal to 18, so that will be true, and I'm going to print 18 or less. Now watch what happens after I hit step over. The program ends, and that's because once this evaluates to true, it has nothing else to do. It will not even look at this else statement. So if I debug this again, and I say that my age is 42, I have user age is assigned the value 42. I'm going to say user age, or 42, is less than or equal to 18. Well, 42 is not less than or equal to 18, so it will evaluate to false. I will not hit line 12, I go straight to line 14, because else says, if all else fails, do what's in my code block. So I'm going to print over 18, and the program is done. So you'll notice there were lots of lines skipped, and that's because I have proper indenting. So let's see what happened if I mess up the indenting. I'm just going to backspace. That's all I did. Now I get all these beautiful, wonderful, squiggly lines, and I try and run it, and I have an exception down here. I have line 12, indentation error, print 18 or less. And that's one of the few times in a programming language it's going to tell you exactly what the problem is. An indentation error means that it is not indented right. It has to be... It cannot be left justified with the if statement. If I have a code block, the only way Python knows that it's a code block is if it's indented properly. So what Python is really telling me is, wait a minute, you got, gave me an if statement, but there's no block underneath it. There's no code block. I can't do anything. You cannot have an if statement or any conditional operator without a code block. Because line 12 is not indented properly, Python doesn't see it as a code block. So it's just going to give you an error and stop. So the way to correct that is to indent it. By indenting it, all my little nasty um, reds went away, and I can run this program. The same thing with else. If I delete that, I'm going to get an error message if I try and run it. I have an indentation error. Same thing. If it's got a colon after it, if it ends with a colon, the next line better be indented. Or you're simply going to have these indentation errors. Now, the next and common issue that a lot of students make is that they forget the colon. And that's very common. I program in Java as well as Python, and I forget colons and semicolons all the time. Um, you just get, I get into a flow, I get programming, and sometimes my fingers just don't hit those keys. So now, if I forget a colon, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to get a syntax error, invalid syntax. So when you're looking at it, and it shows you invalid syntax, and there's nothing where that little caret is, 
it's probably that you forgot the colon. And when I bring back the colon, all the red squigglies go away. So those are some of the things that can happen. Um, yes. Okay. So, oops, did I miss one? No, it does not, Kaylin, always point to the problem. More times than not, and as you will see as we go through um, Python in this class, there are plenty of times when that caret's not going to be right. It's just not going to be right, and the error message will not make sense based on the line it's given you, because it may not even be the same line. So it's something to be very cognizant of. The two that I just showed you are pretty accurate. But after that, when we start getting into loops and things like that, you're going to find that more often than not, Python breaks when it, only when it thinks it really knows there's a problem, and that's usually after the problem has really occurred. So let's keep going. I don't think I had any more on this slide. Let's do that. Okay, just wanted to make sure I didn't have any more to go on this slide. Yeah, I don't think I have any more on this slide. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about flow charts. Now, why in the world have I just gone from if statements to flow charts? Because flowcharts are a really great tool to visually see what's happening in your algorithm. And it's also language agnostic, so that you don't, it, it, it could be a valid flowchart for, and, and um, implemented in Python, just like it could be implemented in Java or C and C++. So uh, I like flowcharts. I find them very handy sometimes when I am, uh, especially when I'm doing complex algorithms, they're very, very helpful. So what's a flowchart? And by the way, you're going to have to provide flowcharts and pseudocode in this week's assignment. So flowchart is a series of symbols that, uh, that have meaning, the shapes have meaning, in a specific order that show the behavior of your algorithm given and you can give it data and follow through. Now flowchart always has a start and always has an end. So you'll have you see the start red start bubble and the red end bubble. The off kiltered rectangle is input. So whenever you have an input, that's what you're going to have. Now there's process, which we'll see a little later. Um, the triangles are decision points. And you can have a true or a false on a decision point. And then you have what happens after that decision point. You can have another decision. You can have an output statement. You can have another input statement. All kinds of things can happen based on the outcome of the decision. And you'll see here I have if user age is less than or equal to 18. If it's false, I print over 18. And if it's true, I print 18 or less. Now, on the right of this, you see this blue box with, that's, that's around the false. That blue box is just there. It's not part of the flowchart. It is just there to say this is what else looks like. Because in the code, you saw the word else, but we don't see else on a flowchart. So that blue box, not part of the flowchart, just to give you a visual of what an else looks like on a flowchart. So let's just run through this. Whoops, wrong T. So I'm the teacher, and I'm testing your code, and I'm putting in 21. So 21 is user age. So I'm going to say 20 is 21 less than or equal to 18. Or better yet, 21 is less than or equal to 18, true or false. That's a false statement. So it's going to evaluate to false. Python doesn't see anything else at this point. All that true stuff just went away. Now I'm going to print over 18. 
and then I'm going to end. So now I'm going to put in 10. 10 says user age. User age is less than or equal to 18, or 10 is less than or equal to 18, true or false. It's going to evaluate to true. So when I evaluate to true, everything on the false side goes away, and I print 18 or less and end the, the code. So that's another visual representation of how to see an algorithm. And we're going to look at this some more and we're going to look at a little pseudocode too because you're going to have to do pseudocode this week. Okay, so we have one more decision maker. I am middle-aged. So, or am I middle-aged? Well, first of all, Python doesn't know what middle-aged is, just like it doesn't know what old is. So, I have my user age and I have my test. User age less than or equal to 18 means that I'm young. And now I have this elif. The elif now says, okay, so you aren't less than or equal to 18, but here's another test. I'm going to test you a second time. So I'm going to test user age, and I'm going to say, well, if user age is less than or equal to 50, then I'm middle-aged. And finally, if I'm not less than or equal to 18, and I'm not less than or equal to 50, then I'm old. So that is how an elif plays into this whole flow. Now you'll notice when I'm going through this that if, elif, if and elif are both testing the value of the same variable. They're both testing user age, which means they are related. So that is how they're related. And um, so when you're going through and you're thinking about building your algorithms, decide whether you think you need to test that variable multiple times. And in the labs, you're going to have to. Okay. So here's just a quick middle age flowchart. And by the way, you have to start doing flowcharts. So there's a, a Google tool called LucidChart. And LucidChart is free, and it can help you do all of this, and you can download it and submit it, and it makes it easier. You can also try doing it in Word or PowerPoint or whatever. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up, and the school recommends use. So here's my middle age flowchart. So now you'll see I have two diamonds. Okay, I have my first check, which is user age is less than or equal to 18, and my second check, which is user age is less than or equal to 50. The true from my first check prints out and ends. The false from my first check, because it's an elif, falls down to the elif statement. Okay, and if I have true, then I print one thing out, and if I have false, I print the other thing out. So if I look at this, I'm going to test it three times. 10, user age is 10, so I'm going to print less than or equal to 18. Everything else goes away in Python's mind, and I'm done. So if I choose the number 21 this time, so 21 is not less than or equal to 18, but it is less than or equal to 50. So that's a true. Everything else goes away. I'm going to print. I'm in the middle. And I'm done. So now I'm going to do it one more time. So my age is 60. I'm not less than or equal to 18. I'm not less than or equal to 50. So everything is false. And I'm, like, I'm going to print, nope, you're old. And I'm done. So there are three conditions. So you have to test it three times because that's what I'm going to do. Um, but this is how you visualize your algorithm. And I find flowcharts very helpful. Okay. So what's this one? Um, this one is just the sky blue one. I don't know why I did this one. Yeah, we don't need this one. It's there if you want it, but 
Okay, so we're going to go to Boolean operators because it's already 940. So there are two Boolean operators. Or actually, let me see something. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, I'm glad you got it, Gideon. Um, let's go back to PyCharm and... This is just if you want to see the code working for this. It's 3.2.2 plus. So let's see. Um, no, I think we're good. And by the way, if there are any challenges you want to specifically see or review, let me know and we'll review them. So we have Boolean operators. We've just done if statements, and those if statements had a value and a variable, and you compared them. That's great if you only have a value and a variable, but I will tell you that a lot of the conditional statements I write are compound, which means they have ands and they have ors. So it's important to understand how they behave. Now, what we're talking about here is Boolean operations. So you have a one and a zero. That's all you have. Or you have a true and a false. Those are the only two values you can possibly have. And it always is, when there's an and involved, true and true is true. True and false is false. So that's an and. With an or, true or true is true. True or false is true as well. So that changes how things can happen. Because remember, it's true or false. And if it's true, it's going to execute the, the code block and skip anything else that's mutually exclusive. And if, if it's false, it's not. So we have to understand how this works. And the Zybooks actually has a very good table that shows all of the AND and OR combinations. But it's important to understand that by compounding them, you actually have to look at the outcome of each individual part of the expression. So if I look here and I have if num1 is the same as 10 and num2 is the same as 2, because of the AND operator, both num1 has to be equal to 10 and num2 has to be equal to 2 for the whole thing to evaluate to true. Um, so if I change it up a bit and I say num1 is equal to 10 and num2 is less than 2 and I have an and in the middle, it will be false because num1, as we can see here, is in fact 10, but num2 is not less than 2. num2 is equal to 2. So this part, the second part of the statement, is false. So I have a true and a false, which is false. Now, if I do the same thing and the only thing I change is the or, what happens is this gets the, the outcome of the whole thing gets flipped because num1 is still 10, num2 is not less than 2, but because I have an or and the first test, num1 equal to 10, is true, the whole thing is true. So the, the same expression, just changing the and to an or, flips what's going to happen. So let's look at simple boolean.py. Uh, where is it? Simple boolean. Okay. So here's just a bunch of, of boolean expressions that allow you to and and or things. Okay. And I just have a is 10 and b is 1. And it, like I said, it's just to give you an example, a working example of how anding and oring works. Where is it? Simple Boolean. I really wish this would come up in alphabetical order. 
So if I if I um, just debug this real quick, I have A is 10 and B is 1. That's easy. Now, I'm going to say A is less is greater than 0 and B is less than 0. Is that true or false? Well, A is 10. 10 is, I'm sorry, 10 is greater than 0 and B is 1 and B is greater than 0. So that's going to be true. Okay? So true and true is true. Now, this is the next one. A is less than 10 and B is greater than 0. So the nice thing about PyCharm here is if I, where is it? Okay. If I just mouse over the expression, it's going to tell me what it is. So B greater than 0 is true. A less than 10 is false. So false and true is still false. So I'm not going to hit line 11. I'm going to go right to 13. And I'm going to say false. Excuse me. False and true is false. Excuse me, and then we'll just go down and do all of these. Now, all we're doing is the same operators, but we're changing them with an OR. And when we change them, the behavior changes, the outcome changes. So that's what I just wanted to, and it can get a little complex. Um, I know that I work with very, very, very smart programmers who sometimes have a problem with compound statements. So it's not uncommon for people to, to, especially when you get to the long compound statements, to start having problems comp computing it in their head to make sure the statement is right. I, on the other hand, have no problem with compound statements. I can't spell the word Wednesday, but I can give you compound statements all day long. And by the way, that's just my funny because I am dyslexic. So Wednesday is not a fun word for me. What do the represent in the statements? Okay, that's a very good question. So these are formats. So what I have here in any of these statements is this is a print statement. And these right here say, I'm going to replace these with something else, expect a dot format at the end. So what these work in conjunction with this function and these arguments to, um, to create the string. So in this case, it's positional. So this is the first thing that's going to be replaced. And the formatter will say A is going to replace that. And then these, right? Uh, open and close squiggly brackets are going to be replaced by B. So that's what that does. Those squiggly brackets are just there. They allow the dot format function on the string to place values in the right spot and they're positional. No problem. Okay. So between. Between is something that you're going to have to use in your labs this week, and it's an important concept to understand. So even though we're going to go through your labs in a couple of minutes, I wanted you to understand how between works. Between is usually done, or almost always done, with an and. And what you're doing is you're testing the, the boundaries. So I have an age that's 20, and I want to know where I fall in this educational, um, in, in, in terms of education. So based on my age, where, am I, where should I be at in my education? So between talks about, it, it gives you your outer bounds. So if I'm zero, if I'm older than zero, because I have to be, and if I'm less than four, then I'm not in school. So those are the boundaries, starting at zero, sorry, starting at greater than zero and ending at less than four. So it would end at three. 
So now I'm going to say, okay, well, what if I am greater than or equal to 4, but I'm less than 9? So there's another set of boundaries. There's the between. I have to be greater than or equal to 4. And that's because my last one was less than 4. So now I want to include 4. The if statement was not inclusive. The elif statement I'm doing now is inclusive. And what do I mean by inclusive? It means that it includes that number 4. So I'm going to be 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. Or sorry, or 8. 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8. And I'm in elementary school. That's what that second if statement does. The third, sorry, that's what the second the ELIF statement does. The second ELIF statement looks very similar. If I'm greater than or equal to 9 and I'm less than 13, I'm going to be in middle school. So that's ages 9, 10, 11, and 12. The next between I'm doing is I'm 13 to 18. So I have 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Then I'm in high school. And then, after that, I'll, I'm just out of school. I can do anything I want. So that's what a between sequence looks like. And I talk about a sequence because none of these really do the job by themselves. You have to have the if, the elif, 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 and else statements to make this work. They are mutually exclusive, but they're also mutually dependent. They are all checking age. We're all checking that same variable. A big key in understanding that they're mutually exclusive. And they all are looking at ranges of, in this case, an age range with a starting and an ending, discrete start and a discrete end. So that's what between looks like. And like I said, you're going to have to use it in your labs. So what time is it? Okay. I want to make sure we get to labs. And complex questions. That's what the labs are going to do to you this week. You are going to be asked to solve complex questions. Um, and so I want to give you some uh, programming help on the complex questions. Now, this is very much like a lab that we're going to have this week that talks about money. And there are two things I want you to know. First of all, do not use division in that lab. Use the floor operator. The floor operator will get you the right calculations. Division will not. So I have a number. The number is 223. And I want to know how many the number of a hundreds and tens, so the number of dollars and the number of nickels in 223. So first of all, I'm going to say numbers is equal to 223, floor 100. And then I'm going to have my new number be number minus hundreds times 100, which will get me the next value, which is the number of tens. So... Now there's this big if thing. Those are just some nice calculations. I didn't even have a decision to make. However, now I have to make a decision because I have to decide how to print them out. So I have hundreds. If hundreds is zero, no hundreds. If hundreds is greater than one, I'm going to print it, print it plural. And if it's not, then I'm going um, to print it singular. And that else statement is wrong. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to do the tens, and it's the same kind of printout. And I apologize, that's just wrong on the output. I will correct that. So here's a flow chart of what we just looked at in code. So I have the number 223. Now, here's a new flow chart symbol. That square, not offset, but just a normal square, is a process. So we have input, process, and output. So those are just processing. So I'm going to set num hundreds equal to num floor 100. I'm going to then set num equal 
the minus hundreds times a hundred. Sorry, there's an extra equal sign there. Now I have my first decision. If hundreds is zero, if that is true, then I'm going to output that there are no hundreds. If that is false, then I'm going to check if hundreds is greater than one. If hundreds is greater than one, then I'm going to output the number of hundreds is. Otherwise, I'm going to output that I have 100. That's it. That's all I have. So I'm going to output that it's 100. Now, after any of these are done, because remember, only one of those is going to happen because they're mutually exclusive. I'm going to say if tens is the same as zero. If it's true, I'm going to output that there are no tens. If it's false, I'm going to check and see if the number of tens is greater than one. If it is, I'm going to output the number of tens is, whatever it is. If it's false, I'm going to output that I just have a single 10, and then I'm done with the program. So that's a nice flow chart. It shows the complexity, the complexness of this problem. See how they got really complex really quick? So let's follow the numbers on this. So I have my, my flow chart. And let's just see what happens when I put in a couple different numbers. Well, if I'm going to say, if I've got the number 223, the number of hundreds is going to be 2. The number of tens is going to be 23. Sorry, the remainder is going to be 23. The number of tens is going to be 2, because um, the floor operator will only give you whole numbers back. So if I go down here and I look, sorry. So basically what that was telling you was that it was going to do the output of hundreds is to and then the, um, the output number of tens is also to. So now I have the number 42. This is a different flow chart. So hundreds is going to be zero. Oh, let me go back. I didn't want to click over that. Well... Now let me go back. I didn't want to click over it as fast as I did. Okay, so if we follow the numbers, we're going to have hundreds is 2, num is 23, tens is 2. So now if I look at the rest of this flow chart, you will see a lot of it disappear. Okay, so I'm going to have, um, I'm going to output number of hundreds is because I have multiple hundreds. And then for tens, I have more than zero tens, and I have more than one ten. So I'm going to put output the number of tens is. So this is the way the ultimate code will flow. But if the number changes, if the number isn't 223, then the flow is going to change. This is called data-driven code. The outcome of what happens depends on what your data you're putting into it. So here, the only thing I have changed is that now the number is 42. So I have no hundreds. My num is still 42. And my tens is 4 because the floor operator only gives me whole numbers. So what's going to happen to my graph? Well, the first thing is number of hundreds is zero, so I'm going to put output no hundreds. And my tens is four, so I'm going to output number of tens is, in this case, it's going to be four. So you'll notice that the flow has changed because I changed a number. That is the power of data-driven code, and, and that's what I wanted to show you with the comparison of these two graphs. So let's see, what time is it? It's 10 o'clock. OK, I thought I missed one. So do you want me to go through the labs and then let you tell me if you want me to see more, if you want to see more code? Or do you want to see more code? You guys can say, hey, I need to see code for blah, blah, blah. And then we'll go through the labs. What would you prefer to do?
because I, I think I would prefer just to go through the labs and let you guys ask questions about the code and everything will be up on the site. Yes, we're going to do the labs. Okay, so let's do the labs. So this is lab 3.1. Whoops, did I miss something? Uh, okay, cool. So this is lab. Oh, what happened to my... Sorry, my mouse went away. There we go. So this is lab 3.1. Point one, three point one one. So I am going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to input an integer, and I'm going to input a second integer, and I'm going to input a third integer. So I have three inputs, and then I'm going to check because what I want to know is I want to know what's the smallest number. So the first thing, this is this requires one of those compound Boolean operators, and I am checking the limits. I'm checking between, so I'm going to use and. And in this case, I'm going to use less than or equal to. So I'm going to say, is num1 less than or equal to num2, and is num1 less than or equal to num3? If so, it's the smallest number. If that's true, I'm going to output num1, because that's the smallest number. If that's false, then I'm going to do another test. And the other test is, now I'm going to test num2. If num2 is less than or equal to num1 and num2 is less than or equal to num3, that means num2 is the smallest number. So I'm going to output num2. Otherwise, I'm going to output num3. So that is how you find the smallest if you're doing it and you're not using the math module. And then they all end. So now, oh, here's my tips. Okay, this is, you got to make sure you convert your numbers. This is where you're going to find the equality and relational operators in sidebooks. Now, here's the pseudocode for 3.11. And we haven't talked a lot about pseudocode, but some people prefer pseudocode. And in the learning module for three, there is a very, very good description of pseudocode and how to use it. Um, but just to let you know, there's no industry standard for pseudocode. So basically what pseudocode does is it tells you the logical steps without being tied to a language. So instead, you know, um, we don't assume equal is assignment. So I will use the word set, and I will say I'm going to set first, which is a variable to something and this is just going to be a user input. Second and third are the same way. Now I have my multi-branch. So I've got if first is less than or equal to, so I'm telling you where to get the relational operators, and that's my Boolean operator, first is less than or equal to third, then I'm going to output first and the same thing. You'll see that this is very much like the flowchart. Some people prefer flowcharts. Some people prefer pseudocode. I prefer flowcharts because I'm more visual, but people who are reading, writing learners much prefer pseudocode. Both are acceptable design tools. And that's what we're trying to teach you. That's what we're trying to introduce with the pseudocode and the flowchart. We're trying to introduce thinking about it before programming in it, because that's very important. So here's the um, lab for 3.12. Now, this is an interesting one, because it's very, it, it is all about compound expressions, compound Boolean expressions. So I'm going to put a month and a day, and I have to say what season that is, whether it's winter, whether it's spring, whether it's summer, or whether it's autumn, excuse me. And I have to test the validity. Now, this is not the whole flowchart. This is a very small part of the flowchart because this flowchart would fit on a slide. It's too complex. Um, so basically, we have two inputs, month and day. And I'm going to say if January and if it's January and day is greater than 1 and 31, then I'm in the winter because that's what the problem has told me. If that is not true, so maybe the month wasn't January, 
or maybe the day wasn't between 1 and 31, then I'm going to go check, check the next option. And this is where we have an elif. And I say is month the same as February and is day greater than 1, should be greater than or equal to 1, sorry. And day is less than 29. If that's true, I'm still in winter. Elif, if it's March, then I have multiple checks to do for the month of March. I have to check because some days in March are in the winter and some days in March are in the spring. So this is the pseudocode. Com very complex code, but very methodical. It, is, it follows a very specific pattern, and that's one of the things that I look for when I'm writing code. I look for the patterns. And the pattern basically is I'm checking the month first, and then I'm checking the days, the dates. So if I put in January and I put in 55, it's not going to output winter because um, the day is greater than zero, but the day is not less than 31 because of this and here, the whole thing becomes false if one part of it is false because of the and. And so it's just going to fall through. I have else, elif, elif. Now March is a little different because March falls between two seasons. So if it falls between two seasons, there has to be another set of checks. These checks are inside they're part of the block inside the elif for March. So that's why I'm only checking March on that line. Month equals March is the only thing I'm checking on that elif statement. The next thing I'm going to do, because I now know it's the month of March, is I'm going to say if it's greater than zero and less than or equal to 19, then I'm in the winter. If it's not, then if it's greater than 19 and less than 31, I'm in the spring, but if I put in March 55, it's invalid. So that's what I have to do. So I always have to take in the fact that Professor Lisa might be sneaky and she might try and see, you know, what, you know, April 109 does in your code. So this is the pseudocode for that and it does look complex, but follow the patterns. The pattern is if a month falls, in a single season, you're going to have a single line check with some ands in it. If the month falls between two seasons, you are going to have to have inside the code block for that month check the between the, the interval checks for the days as they split the seasons. So the seasons are splitting up the days of the month, so you're going to have to check for that. So here's even crazier, Lab 3.13. This is where flowcharts, especially in, in presentations, don't make a lot of sense. So this is our floor operator. This is the one where we have dollars, uh, quarters, nickels, dimes, and pennies. And I have to figure out how many of each I have. And to do that, I use the floor operator, and I do some arithmetic, and then I use the floor operator, and then I do some arithmetic. And I do a lot of that before I even do a single if statement. Excuse me, my throat was dry. So, and then I start to do a bunch of if statements. Um, if dollars is greater than zero, then I output dollars. Um, and if it's equal to one, I output dollar, and if there are no dollars, then I go to quarters, then I go to nickels, then I go to dimes. Now, by the way, it is important to do the calculations in a specific order. If you start with pennies, whatever number you put in is always going to be that number of pennies, because it's one. But So you want to start with the greatest value. You want to start with 100 with dollars, and then move your way down to quarters, nickels, dimes, and quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. So here's the pseudocode for it. Again, it's long and compounded, but if you look for the patterns, 
you will find that the if statements kind of break themselves down. First of all, in the pseudocode, very first thing I'm going to check is the user input. I don't want to do anything if the user input zero or negative one or negative anything. So the first thing I'm going to do is check for the validity of the input because Professor Lisa is sneaky and she might put in minus 99 to your code to see what it does. So that's the first check and if I'm nasty and I put in minus 99, I want to see that there's no change and the, the, the script just is done. The next thing I'm going to do, let's assume that I haven't put in negative 99. I want to then do all my calculations. So I'm going to say number dollars is equal to the input value. I'm going to use the floor operator 100. Then I'm going to figure out what the new input value is, and I'm going to do that all um, for quarters, dimes, nickels. And now penny is just whatever is left over. Then we get to all the decisions. So I have dollars, quarters, nickels dimes, nickels, and pennies. I'm going to get that backwards all night. So the first thing I want to do is I want to figure out how to print out my dollars. I check first if I have any. If I don't have any, then I don't need to do anything. So I'm just going to move on to the next one. But if I do have dollars, I have to know whether or not to print the word dollar or print the word dollars. So I'm going to output whatever the number is, and then I'm going to check if the number of dollars that I have is equivalent to 1, so it's the same as 1, then I'm going to output the word dollar. Otherwise, I'm going to output the word dollars. Then I'm going to do the exact same thing for quarters. Okay, now it's quarters greater than or equal to 0. And I'm going to output the number of quarters. And then I'm going to check if I only have one quarter, and then I'm going to put out, print out the right thing. Dimes sorry, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies are all the same. So that is what I mean by look for the patterns when you're doing this code, okay? It is very, very, it's very pattern related, especially in this one. So that was that. Yes. Okay, so why we have to start with the greatest value. If I start, if I'm looking at this problem, and I start with pennies, I say set num pennies equals input floor 1, then I'm going to have everything as pennies. If I put in 22, I'm going to have 22 pennies. And then I'm going to try and do quarters, and there won't be any quarters. But, sorry, no, 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 it'll be zero after that because I'm saying input value equals input values minus the number of dollars times 100. Or in this case, I would say minus the number of pennies times 1. So my num value becomes zero, and nothing else will be hit because it's all going to be pennies. That's why in this problem you have to start with the largest number comparison. So we're going to start with dollars, and then I will get the true number of dollars. And then from the remainder of that, I will get the true number of quarters. So does that help, Kaylin? Okay. Does anybody have any questions? We can open up the mics if you like, and you can ask questions and we can talk about things, or we can call it a night. I will leave that to you guys. Okay, going once. Going twice. Okay, I'm going to call it then. This will be up tomorrow on YouTube, and it will have all of the challenges and the extra code. Um, if you're in my class, please reach out to me if you have any questions at all. And I hope to see you next week. I'll talk to everybody later. I'm going to stop the